Tam Tam. How are you? Um, I'm just happy this day is almost over because I am done being a homeschool teacher. <laughs> like I am such an asshole when it comes to homeschooling my kid. I have no patience. She's like, mommy, how do you spell cat? I'm like, you're not stupid. <laughs> like the worst. She's going to have issues literally for the rest of her life. That's going to start from this freaking pandemic. Oh my God. Tell me about it. This is like it's really not fair. This is just testing us even more during this it's pandemic not. as if we can't, you know, just being on top of each other isn't enough. Now we're freaking teachers and it's like, where yeah. does this end? Where does this end? end? Oh my it's God. It's not ever going to end. It's never going to end, Tam. And like, why? We'll never go back but to then I think normal life. People without kids mm -hmm. is a better and so maybe we should ask our next guest, yes, whom I've loved for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, if it is better being quarantined <laughs> without small children. <laughs> She's like, yes, it so, is. <laughs> so who do we have here, Roxy oh, Sussing? We've got the one and only Matt and Matthews. Man and Matthews. I love the way her name sounds, too. It's like Matt and Matthews. Yeah. And if you don't know her, then you don't know anything <laughs> about comedy or, <laughs> or improv or Vine because she actually started on Vine. Um, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I knew she had like 3 million followers, but I didn't know she had like 1.6 billion, billion in the B's streams, oh which is God. insane. And why is she doing our show? So welcome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank welcome, you. Welcome. Man and rhymes with Tamman. Oh, and salmon thanks. and contamination. <laughs> <laughs> I once had a boyfriend that had tamman on his arm. Um, and now it's just a big old leaf. But I don't know where that story was going. But yeah, tamman is an interesting name. Where did your name come from? Manon is a French way to say it, which I wish I said it like that, but I Ooh. don't speak French. So it's just a phony French name that turned American Manon. 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 <laughs> but when did your parents make it up? Was it like... They didn't make it they... up. <laughs> <laughs> well, my was made up. <laughs> 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 what should we uh, do? That was trot. happened to me. Oh. Yeah, they were like, "Oh, ta Tamman." They were, yeah. I don't. This is a great story. <laughs> so there's no other Tamman on the planet. No, mm -mm. that's pretty sick. Only people who like are super obsessed with me and <laughs> name their kids after me. Has that happened yet? <laughs> like one or two weirdos. Yeah. Sure. I, I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been tagged in some baby photos of like we named our baby Manon. Uh, and I, th I thought that was like the biggest honor out of anything you could ever <laughs> receive. Um, they saw a movie, a French movie in the 80s called Jean de Florette. And the sequel was called Manon of the Spring or Manon de Sous. And it was about mm -hmm. this long, blonde haired, naked, free spirit running through the fields. And they were like, that's the name. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's the one. She's it. She's it. <laughs> we want that to be our daughter. <laughs> Not far off. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how it came about. Okay. Well, you are like Stephanie. Ah, oh, okay, Stephanie. I, I like I like Manon. 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 I spoke French at school. Mm -hmm. And it served me no purpose because I live <laughs> in America. And I have friends who have kids in French school, and I'm like, well, you do know they're either going to leave you and go to France or have no real reason to use French. So, Except on yeah. their first date to look cool, you know? Yes. Or when you're drunk. Because all of a sudden the French comes back to you after you've had a cocktail or two, I notice. Yeah. Like, it comes oh, back to you, Roxy. I'm like, that's not French. <laughs> yeah, that's not <laughs> actually the language. <laughs> Bonjour, y'all. <laughs> yeah. So you were born so, and raised in Los Angeles, mm. which is crazy because not a lot of people are from here. Mm -hmm. So what's it like growing up in LA? So just to, just to give you, I'm from Australia. I know I've lost the accent. That's a whole nother story. And Roxy's from Texas, from Dallas, Texas. Texas. Okay. So tell us what it's like <laughs> to be in LA. Well, I did pick up your accent. I was about to say, I hear Australian, like just, just from like, Wood. Like, like sitting with <laughs> like New York and mascara. <laughs> That's a good one. That's good. Um, I don't know. It's what I know. So I, you know, people always say that, especially in the industry and in acting industry. They're like, mm. "What? You're from here? That's so weird." And I'm like, "That's everyone I know is from here." <laughs> Duh. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's cool, you know. Mm -hmm. Grew up in Calabasas. 
Well, first uh-huh. Sherman Oaks, first Sherman Oaks, and then Calabasas. So, so this really, is like before you're, the Kardashian days. You're a Valley girl. Yeah, I'm a Valley girl. I'm totally. from the Valley, straight. You know, like I just love my Starbucks lattes, and <sighs> I'm very aligned with that character. That's why I actually do that character is because I know it so well, because even though I despise it, it also mm-hmm. lives within me. I feel like we mm-hmm. pull from little parts of ourselves and then magnify oh, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have you can to. take, you can take the girl out of the Valley, but you can't take the Valley out of the girl now. Can you? Right. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't. <sighs> so yeah, it was cool. It was fun. It was, you know, I went to like mm-hmm. acting classes from a young age. I was always performing, always dancing around. There was always like a camera on me. And so mm-hmm. I think like, even from a young age, my dad was always filming cause he moved here to, you know, pursue, honestly, I think he's tried to pursue acting for like a second and then decided to do, become a writer, even though I feel like he would have been a great actor. Mm. So growing up because you're from Los Angeles and because this is a transient town, you know, where people are coming in and out, was it hard to make friends? Mm-hmm. Wh- wh- at what point? Like just as you were growing up, yeah. she's like, "I'm not a weirdo." <laughs> yeah, totally. I had no friends yeah, ever. Really. Yeah, I had a great group of friends for okay. it, until fifth grade. So, uh, so grade school, I was killing it. I would okay. like organize relay races, and I was uh-huh. like the head. Sporty Spice was the, always the one mm-hmm. I picked, and I was like, "All right, let's do this." I was on drill team, and then we moved to Calabasas because I guess <laughs> the schooling was better. And that's when everything went downhill and I had no friends and I started getting made fun of and told I was like buff and hairy. And then like randomly on the bus, this girl would walk. (laughs) (laughs) So much weird adjectives to put together. Like you're buff (laughs) and hairy. Okay, they were. (laughs) Thanks a lot. (laughs) Yeah, like cool. Um, And like just in time for junior high too, right? Like as you're uh, going into puberty. Yeah, the things you don't want to be as a girl. You want to be like petite and soft, not very Why though? Why do we want to be petite and soft? My daughter yeah. says to me, she's like, mommy, I don't want to be fat and hairy. And I'm like, <laughs> why? And she literally said that yesterday. <laughs> Funny me talking about it because she literally mm-hmm. said, I don't want to be fat and hairy. And I was like, where did you learn that from? Like, why, mm-hmm. why aren't women allowed to be wild? Like, why do we have to stay in this specific box for what? For men so that they think that we're like attractive to them? Like, why can't we just be be anything you know what i mean and i think just because the majority of what young women are seeing are magazine you know like Mm -hmm. there's Mm -hmm. not as many fat and hairy sorry this is is the podcast episode is going to be called (laughs) so i'm sorry about the title (laughs) but it's really that's just who she is she's just anyway yeah I, i think it's just because of what we see you know I didn't ever yeah. want to be hairy. No one, mm-hmm. I, none of the women I saw were hairy. So I thought, oh, this is, this is what's wrong. It's the thing that sticks out. And so I right. made a career out of being the funny, right? The funny, oh. as I'm sure you know, because you're both very funny, is doing, is doing the wrong, not the wrong thing, but doing the odd thing out. And so because I started getting made fun of, I was like, oh, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to be even quicker than them to beat Mm -hmm. them to the punch. I'll make myself a fool first Mm -hmm. so that they don't make me the fool. And I learned that later in therapy, which was like, interesting how you get to (laughs) control when they laugh at you. And I'm like, what? A lot of comedy comes from pain, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's where we, you know, I was 200 pounds as a kid. I'm sure the listeners are like, please don't mention that story again. And I'm not going to tell you the story again, but that's why I was like the funny overweight kid because that's how people would like me. Um, but I'm not upset about it. I think that you're, you get so many lessons and they're all gifts if you choose them to be. Um, but you just wish you didn't have to go through the pain to get to the good stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Like it would be nice yeah. not to have to, but maybe you don't get to the good stuff unless you go through the pain first. You can't because mm-hmm. it's the right. It's the touchstone. Like there is, you you wouldn't be able to experience the joy without having a reference point to pain because mm-hmm. you wouldn't know what joy is just like mm-hmm. you wouldn't know what light is without the dark. Like, Oh, the sun, all that. See, I wouldn't have had reference if it was just always there. If it's always there, you don't appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you say that you were bullied growing up? Yeah. You were. Okay. Yes. And that in turn, again, made me not only bully myself, but occasionally I would fight back. Like I would go home and cry and talk to my dad and be like, what do I do? And they're like, 
you know, he first said, kill him with kindness. And so I remember this girl turned around and she was like, she said I was ugly and she made fun of my gap Mm t-shirt and and I practiced. I was like, okay. And she go, and then I said, well, you and your friend are really pretty. And they were just like, what the hell is wrong with you? And so I didn't do that again. And then, (laughs) and then I, (laughs) And then I just, and then he was, and then my dad said, okay, well you need a good comeback. And so then I tried that and it, it like got them to kind of back off, but it never mm. felt really good. So. Hmm. I think bullying comes from like the, I think it starts in the home. I do because mm-hmm. the lessons and the life we teach, uh, I have a seven year old, Roxy has a six year old and I have a baby, baby, one and a half year old. Mm. And mm. what I try to teach her is to lead with kindness. And I know she wouldn't be a bully. She'd probably be a kid that gets bullied more than she would bully. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the lessons that you teach our children. And it really does put a mirror up to parents and how important they are in, in ways we raise our girls, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And we have to look at like the why and like where it comes from. So I hope that that changes. I hope that uh, parents do take a stand and they start to change the way that they raise their kids. You know, that's where I think it starts from. Yeah. And maybe some sort of weekend seminar training before going into, <laughs> <laughs> before going into Don't school. be a bitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't be a bitch camp. Don't be a bitch boot camp. Oh my God. That's so good. Roxy, I just made you a million camp. dollars. There it is. There it is. I'm, I'm running with it. I'm running with it. How not to be an asshole. <laughs> How not to be an asshole. <laughs> That's so fun. So great. I mean, so, but also because you are in Los Angeles growing up, it almost makes it, I want to say like impossible to not go into entertainment. Wouldn't you say so? Because we're so, we're so influenced by it here. Mm-hmm. What do you think I, about You that? would think, right? But yeah. I'm like one of the only people, I can think of like two other girls, not even in my grade. And I, I, I think I graduated with like I don't know, 500 people. And so there was like always over a thousand, 1500, like there was just a big school Mm -hmm. and out of the, you know, there was two people in a grade above me and I can't think of anyone else who's in the entertainment. Oh, really? Uh, uh, Acting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Cause that maybe there's another guy that's a filmmaker, but it's like, I'm, I'm surprised cause I figured everyone wants to do what I want to do. And you know, they didn't. And so it is, it is, it was weird. Um, Mm -hmm. and even the people I reconnected with in, um, uh, elementary school there, they didn't pursue movies or TV or acting or anything. It's bizarre. I just Mm -hmm. always project that everyone wants to do what I want to do all the time. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's a problem. What was your ultimate goal? (laughs) Was your ultimate goal to just be creative and make people laugh and entertain? Or was your ultimate goal to be in film and TV and win an Oscar. Like what, what was, what was the end game for you? I mean, that was me. Like, seriously, I was five years old and I'm like, I'm bitch, I'm winning an Oscar by the time I'm 30. When I hit 30, I was like, mm. I was like, life goals have been lost. I thought it was easy. I was like, I can do this. It's not that hard. They make it look easy. They make Uh it really look easy by Uh only showing you the good stuff. I, I always, for some reason, same kind of thing, not about winning awards, but I always saw like, uh, I don't know if fame's a good word, but I always saw like, oh, people are gonna, they're gonna just know me, but I didn't Mm -hmm. know how or when, because I always knew I liked being behind the camera and I loved directing and bossing people around and telling them Mm -hmm. exactly what to do because I know how the story's going to go. So it kind of started with directing. I was always kind of goofy and I liked that, but stand up didn't really come into my consciousness until... Mm -hmm you know, I was around 23 years old. Um, com- uh, improv comedy came to play a few years before that. And I thought, you know what, I would love to be on a sitcom like friends. That feels like a dream mm-hmm. to me. It's like, Oh, a, a group of people rehearsing, laughing, and then live. That feels fun. SNL. I'm getting paid a million dream. dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doesn't hurt. <laughs> that doesn't hurt. Man. That would be great. Um, <laughs> Courtney Cox just started following me, by the way. And I know we saw that. Out. Oh, I mean, that's my. pretty amazing. Yeah, you, yeah that Courtney Cox Jennifer, and Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. How did Jennifer Aniston, like, how did that go? How did that happen? That was in October. And okay. that was 
the best day of my life because I was <laughs> doing breath work and I was like, my life's over. And I was just breathing through it. And then, and then, um, I think Beyonce's spirit came on and I was like, I'm all I need. It's okay, girl. I got you. I got you. <laughs> and, and I got out of breath work and I was like in line at Starbucks or something. And, and someone messaged me saying, I can't believe Jen follows you. And I was like, what? Cause she had just joined and it was like a big deal. Remember? And, and mm-hmm. then I saw that she followed me and I was like, what the hell? And so I sent her a nice message being like, you're my hero. And da, 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 you bring the world so much joy. And she was like, you do too, by the way, wink face. And then we've been, and I was like, what? Cause you just never know who yeah. is watching. You never know. At so all. that's when you can't yeah. create for, uh, you just got to create for yourself. You never yeah. know who's going to affect. Right. We never thought social media was going to be a thing with like, you know, that's, that's why my original where I was like, okay, I'll be on shows, movies, hopefully do mm-hmm. it all. But you know, when I got on Vine, it wasn't like, and now I'm going to get a following and hopefully that, no, it was just like, mm-hmm. I like making videos and I like being goofy and it feels safe in the home and here we go. And, you know, I believe that the, the when you love doing something, as I'm sure you guys know, it, it pays back and the world just loves to watch us have fun and enjoy ourselves really is what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. And you were following your true, what you needed to be doing at that right time. You know, it's like the timing of yeah. it and like your purpose. So that obviously, I mean, how could you even thought of that? You know, back when growing up, you know, you have these dreams and then social media happens and it changed Mm -hmm. your life. Mm -hmm. So what was like that moment where you were like, oh my God, like this is now things are different now. I had, I think I just woke up after doing a Kristen Stewart impression and saw that like I had a million notifications or whatever. And within a week, a hundred thousand followers within a month, 500,000 within a, and then it was like a million. And I just, people were watching Uh and I was getting a lot of feedback and it was just like, finally someone sees like, Mm. I'm not crazy for thinking that I think this is hilarious, Mm -hmm. but you know, like that's, what's most important is that you enjoy it. Of course. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it can be shared just is the cherry on top. And you know, it just, it makes me, it's made me feel connected. It's made me, I met so many friends from it that like are like-minded that also like to make videos. So now I have Mm -hmm. a playful, playful partners in my life again, Mm -hmm. you know, it kind of brings that back that like childhood sense of wonderment of like, you know, I get to make videos, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. like I can't even imagine having had access to a cell phone when I was like eight. Mm -hmm. The things that we can do. Devastated Vine shut down because for the first time you were seen and for the first time you did have people following you in your videos. And then were you like, now what? Like, it's like almost like a cruel joke, you know, all of a sudden 3 million people are gone. And then what do you do? Do you go to other platforms? Do you ask Mm -hmm. people to follow you? But is it ever the same? Is it ever the same people who were really invested in the one thing? Do those platforms even sustain that type of material? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, it, I felt like it was coming. I'm very intuitive and I sense things. And so there was something always in the back of my mind of like, this is going to shift. Now, what I regret doing was not going, okay, now follow me on Instagram. Now follow me on mm-hmm. YouTube and let's continue this journey. I didn't do that because I, at the time, found it tacky. And I was like, I don't want people to like get annoyed and whatever. And so I felt the grief of it about a year later when I mm. saw my numbers on Instagram and allowed that to dictate like my inner peace by going, these are just not the same. Like I couldn't help mm-hmm. but compare the billion loops to like, oh, I have 50,000 views on this video that I think is hilarious. And it hurts. Mm-hmm. I feel it, like it hurts. I create content does. all the time. My husband and I, we have a production company and we have some shows we just sold, but it's like, if those well, shows don't do well, yeah, but it it is great, but we've been doing this for fucking ever like you have. But if those, if those shows don't do well and people don't see it and you think it's fucking hilarious... It's like, what's the point? Mm-hmm. I don't, for, for us, it's not, we want p- it, us to be successful and get the money, although that's great. We have two small children. I would love to have <laughs> lots of money. But the point is, if you make something, you want people to see it. And if people aren't seeing it and sharing it and enjoying it, you feel like, what's the point? It's like, why am I creating this video that I've spent so much time on and written and directed 
And like my family sees it, you know, Mm -hmm. it does. I think those numbers do matter. Even if people say, ah, it doesn't matter. I'm just, I love to do it. They do matter. I feel, well, they do. Well, they're Mm -hmm. the only, they matter to me. They do. They, I think they absolutely do. And, you know, they might not for a person whose livelihood doesn't depend on it Mm -hmm. for the people that are just watching and going entertainment and they're not looking at the numbers. So they're just focused on the content. And luckily you've been in put in their algorithm because they watch you. So they see your stuff all the time. But I've, I just had someone who goes, Oh, you know what? I forgot about you for the last two years because of the algorithm, even though I've been following you, I haven't seen any of your, your videos, but I'm so happy that this one did well, you know, cause it pushed it up and blah, blah, blah. And it, it like irked to me that I have no control over that. Mm-hmm. I can't help but compare to the 3 million and where every video was just like, not every video, but you know, they did a lot better and you can't help that's quantifiable results to see a number and to mm-hmm. uh, like to go, okay, it didn't perform the same, whether it was good or not, you know? And then there's the other people that I can't help but go, okay, they came from Vine. I came from Vine. They have mm-hmm. 20 million followers. I have 600,000. What, you know what I mean? Like, I hate that, course, but I'm like, the happiness, but yeah. who doesn't do it? Yeah. Who doesn't do right. it? Yeah. And I go, oh, where did I, what did I, what did I do wrong? And, mm-hmm. and then it's not like I ever question whether I'm funny or not, but I do question that like, I, I am a, I'm a, a, not acquired taste, but maybe I'm not as a general funny, like maybe I should be doing the more obviously funny stuff, mm-hmm. but for some then reason I love the, for, but then you're creating for other people yeah. and not yourself for yeah. views mm-hmm. and that's a slippery slope yeah i'm just saying yeah. because i know because all of a sudden you're like oh they like that then you're never happy because you're just posting stuff that you think that they want mm-hmm. and then it's not you yeah and but i really a- get a kick mm-hmm. out of when i when when people like the stuff that i think is really funny and unique mm-hmm. when they like that it feels so much better than when i do the obvious joke like to you what is the funniest stuff that you do like what is the stuff that brings you the most joy Um, I like doing characters. And so like Mm -hmm. when I do a character who's like the salesman and she's trying to pitch you and she's like, okay. And she's like, just the movements. I really like like movements and characters and rhythms. And there's something about that for me. Like, I think that's why I like Jim Carrey or whatever is because he's not only doing something that's clever Mm -hmm. auditorily, but he's mixing it with a kinesthetic feel with the beat, with a face. And so that stuff tickles me a lot because it catches me off guard. Um, and I don't actually do enough of that. I also like just kind of like improv with friends. Like I've, I've mm-hmm. recently done a, a quarantiners where it's like an eight minute video of me living with my roommate. And he's, you know, it's like, it feels like a scene and I like that kind of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily work for Instagram. And people do you feel pressure it. to create? Like you have to create a specific amount per week. Mm -hmm. and get a certain number of hits because, you know, a lot of people probably who listen to this podcast, their livelihood isn't dependent on views. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I can explain that more people get brand deals and they get, you know, certain uh, platforms, you get paid for as many views as you get. So it's that constant, you know, how do I survive if I'm not hitting my benchmarks? Mm -hmm. And then that causes pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I. She's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, you've got people breathing down your neck. You've got agents and managers and brands, and yeah. you know that all want you to meet certain certain marks. And it's like, if you you feel, yeah. do you feel that pressure, like where it's like, oh god, like this view didn't get a hundred thousand, you know, more mm-hmm. views or what, whatever the number is. I think I've gotten into a pretty good mental place about it. Um, as far as feeling the pressure, I've always been very spontaneous and, and, you know, in the moment with it and like, mm-hmm. I'll make this and I just love it. And I post, you know, TikTok's revamped the whole vine thing. Cause I just mm-hmm. put a million there. And that makes me feel like, okay, they are for creators. They are, it's a lot more positive you know, than Instagram, in my opinion, um, as far as the comments go, it's a lot more supportive. It's a lot more for, you know, I, I resisted it for a, lo- a long time mm-hmm. and I would get, I would get angry <laughs> when I would see people lips, lip syncing. Cause I was like, ah, that's so easy. But 
then I started doing it and I, because of course it's not easy, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, I guess it's not easy. And it's like, it's like, well, whatever, if it's easy for me, then I should just be doing it. Let me embrace it. Let me, let me welcome it and not resist what is right. Mm-hmm. I accepted what is and TikTok is what is. And I've had so much fun in it the last few months and it's, it's paid off. And a lot of people are like, Oh, I remember you from Vine. And so I think people are, I just have to just trust the flow rather than resist and try to, you know, you know, there, cause there is a weekly quota for Instagram. If you're, if you're to grow and it's too much for me, like mm. I, I miss the mark every, I'm like, how many am I, I'm supposed to do eight stories a, a day. Like I can't do that. And then I, but I want to post, I love posting, but I get in my moods and then I love <laughs> my moods to dictate how I post, which is mm. you know, talking we about have, moods. Oh, and this is, you know, something that you can talk as much as you want to about. You recently went through a very hard heartbreak. Um, you were married for a year. Was it a year? Yeah. Just over a mm-hmm. year. Um, and then you found out that your husband was doing something behind your back. I'm not exactly sure what that was. Um, Knitting. How? You what? Pardon? Knitting. Knitting. <laughs> Knitting. He was doing... <laughs> he was doing behind, behind your back. back. <laughs> so fucked up because like <laughs> knitting is just the ultimate betrayal. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're more than welcome to share anything and everything or nothing. Um, how... How did you find out? Like how did mm. you know that something was wrong? Um, I actually had just gotten my wedding photos and I was looking at them on my couch and I was just like, these are the most beautiful wedding photos of my life. Like they look like they could be in magazines and it was the most beautiful wedding um, I've ever had. <laughs> the only one I've ever mm-hmm. had. Um, and I got a text from my best friend and he and his girlfriend were like, Hey, can we come take you to coffee? And I was like, why don't you come over and I'll show you the wedding photos. They're like, no, come to coffee. And then they took me to coffee, like down the street. And, um, they looked, they like, their energy was so scared. And they kept looking at each other. Like they had something to tell me. I was like, what? And then they put their arm on me and they're like, um, and my best friend Travis said, um, what I'm about to tell you is, is not going to be easy to hear, but I want you to know that I have your back. I have your back always. And I'm like, what? And it, my whole body mm. like got that feeling of like, oh. are you going to tell me someone just died? Like, please don't tell mm-hmm. me my dad's dead or, mm-hmm. or, or my husband's dead. Please, please, please. And he goes, this girl reached out to me and she sent me a message that said, hi, Travis, Manon's going to really need a friend right now as her husband's been messaging me for the last three weeks, very explicitly, Mm -hmm. um, photos, videos saying, I love you. I've always loved you. Uh, I'm not going to be with Manon forever. That's for sure. She's nothing. She's useless. She's (gasps) not sexy. She's not funny. All these horrific things. And I'm reading this and I know it's him because it's exactly how he writes Mm. and it's him in the photos Mm -hmm. in the shower, in the kitchen of the house that I just bought for us a a month, like five days before the wedding that we moved in. Um, and this isn't something, so I, I am in shock. I didn't, I didn't, uh, on no level was this expected. Mm -hmm. It was completely completely news to me. Um, we spent every waking second together. He treated me like a queen. Mm-hmm. You don't wow. seem like, like everybody in my life just loved him. And they were like, man, you just met your person. We can mm-hmm. just see it. We, we, he loves you. He adores you. Like he's just, he's really charming and charismatic and, and everybody just fell in love with him. And you know, all these things like, the, the list goes on and on of our of our love story, which I do say the whole thing in my podcast on the third episode, where it's like we meet immediately. I knew he's going to be my husband. We have the wedding song that I hear, and I'm like, oh, that's that's going to be our wedding song. And then it later was our wedding song, and we just had a beautiful relationship. We didn't fight, you know. We we really communicated beautifully, like 
I'm a huge communicator. I'm all about holding space for people, especially if they're in pain. I'm not about to take it personal and go and have two people, you know, bleeding all over each other with their wounds. I'm easily able to detach and go, okay, you're experiencing something. Even if you think it has something to do with me, I'm going to hold the space and let you feel it. And he did the same thing with me a lot. Like, that's why I felt like the luckiest girl in the world is because of this beautiful relationship we had. So when I found that out, it really scared the shit out of me. I, I got so scared. I had no idea. I felt like you had just told me that actually my name is Stephanie and that I am actually 62 and that my mom is Marlon Brando. Like I just, none of it. Mm-hmm. it just, no. I was like, what are you talking What's about? your face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I went home and I actually packed a bag and I got my key and I put it in my pocket and I was like right near where the door is. Cause I, at this point, I don't know who this person is because he's t- telling someone else that he loves them and that he always has. And I'm like, I look at I'm like, I don't know who this girl is. Like, huh? Was it just her? It was just her? Well, so far as we know. Mm. Okay. Later, you'll hear a little bit more that there's multiple Mm. And it wasn't just after the wedding, it was throughout the whole relationship. It's like being with somebody you totally didn't even know. It's like you think you know this person, but it's like a split personality almost. You know? Yeah, that's that's exactly because I still can't wrap my head around it. You know, he he was kind enough to admit the whole thing and he started crying and for 48 hours I just proceeded to hold the space for him because and shower and sage him and like a nice person. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, well, my mind. I think I just recognized, I thank God I had done so much, so many seminars (laughs) and so many, so many healing things so that I could, so probably to get me ready for this moment, because at that point, my first thought was, oh my God, he must've been in so much pain to be like, he had to hold on to this and just act like, like, that was my per- per thought was, I didn't go, what? I'm not sexy. What? I'm boring. What? Mm-hmm. I didn't think that. I it was like, that's not mine. That is, <laughs> that's everything to do with him trying mm-hmm. to make me small to make himself bigger, trying to keep her attention. Cause we later learned that he just really needs outside validation in order to feel, to feel good enough and had to make me small to make himself feel bigger and blah, blah, blah. And, um, yeah. And then like two days later I had to, Two days after I found out I had to, I didn't have to, but I decided to take care of myself and have him leave the house. And mm. we Did he apologize and say, I want to be with you? Yeah. Yeah. He said, I'm sorry. I'm sick. Um, I'll do anything. And then I was like, okay, first of all, unfollow <laughs> all these 600 women that are half naked. I didn't know he was following all these wow. women commenting you know, on their butt pictures saying you're doing such a good job. Like, but, and I, so it was all like starting to come to get like a year. Mm. This It's been a year. So a lot's transpired after that. Obviously I wrote a book about it, not about mm-hmm. it. I wrote a book about my life, but there's a chapter that I included um, about it because it was so, it's what propelled me to write the book was this event just completely transformed my life. And the way I see things. I was very, very, um, trusting when I met him and very open and like, you know, I have a really great father who loves me so much. And, (laughs) and, and so I just projected that on all men. I was like, no man would ever hurt me. Like people love me and they are always looking out for me, which is a great way to be, but Mm -hmm. also you got to have some discernment, especially when it comes to your heart. Well, you know, I was just going to say two, actually two things. Um, the first is that's really amazingly like evolved of you to be able to sort of separate yourself out of that and to know that that was him in the moment of like when you're finding all these mm. things out, which is incredible because like Tamman had said, and like I would have done too, because I would have just been like, oh, fuck Lord. you. Yeah. Like literally killed him. Um, but also when something like this happens to you and the trust is broken how do you go on to like finding love again? Like, are you scared to kind of open yourself back up again? Like, how are you feeling about that? Yeah. You know, in my book, I write like, may I not close my heart off to the world because of another man's pain? Like that Mm -hmm. would be the biggest shame of it all is for what a lot of women do is they generalize men 
Mm -hmm. And now all men suck and all men are liars and all men are pigs, which is not true. Some, and some are great. And I want a partner. I want companionship. And I know, I know it's, it's been a difficult journey this last year with, you know, I, I ended up going to therapy and giving it a shot, even though I had, he had completely broken my trust because I thought, you know, um, he says he wants to change. I know a lot of everyone in my life was like, no man, and run like, this is way too soon. Like maybe mm-hmm. if it was 10 years down the line and you had a couple mm-hmm. kids and it was like, you weren't seeing each other ever. And it was physical, but just that, but the fact that he talks shit about you behind your back to a stranger so soon after the wedding, like just weird. But I was like, yeah. And I, I just saw it from a different place. And I thought, let's, let's give therapy a try. Cause I actually think that'll be very healing for me to do it. So it was something I did for myself and it would help me understand him even more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also didn't want that looming over my head of like, well, what if, what mm-hmm. if I left too soon? What if it would have worked out if we went to therapy? But now I know that I didn't see the changes I needed to see. Um, and so I was able to walk away like all done rather mm-hmm. than like, mm. so it's been, it's been interesting, you know, to, to, I, I'm not like, you know, I'm going to close my heart off. I, mm. you know, I'm, I'm living with Johnny, who's my roommate and he, he moved in actually shortly after the lockdown happened and he's held the space for me quite a bit. I mean, he knows exactly like if I hear a specific song and I start crying, he's there. And so basically he's been like my witness to my pain, which has helped transform it. Like, which is what healing is, is loving the parts of ourself that hurt. And so I think what's helped me heal is just like crying a lot and sharing a lot about it, writing about it and being open and cutting to the, the not generalizing. I'm very, um, Mm -hmm. I have my master certification in neuro-linguistic programming. So I'm very aware of language and how Mm -hmm. it drives our behavior. And I'm very particular with what I say to my unconscious mind. So that plays a huge role in keeping my heart open Mm. to the right man. If that makes sense. Oh. Do you feel like when you went into therapy, like how did you know that you were done? Was it because the trust had been too broken that you just knew in your heart that you couldn't rebuild it? Or did you feel like it was more that he would not change even though he said he was going to? Mm. Which I guess is still a trust issue. Oh, it was a it was more of like a okay, that was strike one. Mm. And then strike two happened. Right. So it kept, ha- it kept happening after <laughs> therapy. Mm. It, it, um, I don't know about, well, I don't or know. During, right. Yeah. Cause we, so that had to happen in like early September and then we didn't start therapy about until October. And so there was a good like month and a half where I was like, I don't know what's going on. Um, but I know that we hung out one night before therapy and mm-hmm. something told me to check his phone and, I was like, wait, what? And it's still going on, right? Basically. And and then strike three happened on Christmas Eve. My dear, dear friend who I trust so much happened to interview a girl that he worked with who mm. revealed more information. And I was just like, and at that point I was, I told him, I was like, I'm at 2%. If anything goes wrong, I, I have to tell you, I am warning you that I will walk away. This isn't like me threatening. I'm actually letting you know that I'm running on empty here. Mm -hmm. Um, cause something in my gut too. And my therapist, um, earlier in the year reflect, I went by myself at this point and he goes, you know what, you know what the through line that I remember working with you guys for those three months, you kept saying something doesn't feel right. And I just don't trust Mm -hmm. you. And I don't know why. And so listening to the gut is so important Mm -hmm. and I don't think we do it enough. And I don't think I did it even in the relationship when little, when little things would come up that they weren't big deals, but my gut definitely like sometimes with my physicality would lean back. And, and when our unconscious mind does that, it's like almost a sign of not trusting. Mm -hmm. And I think that happened a few times and we kind of would joke about it, but now I look back and go, Oh, I don't think I trusted him a for some reason, because he was too love bomby a lot of the time, just like, you're the most mm. amazing thing. I've never felt this way. Tattooed hit my name all over across his heart. And I, and I, at the time was like, oh, this is so romantic. But now looking back, I'm almost like, who is he trying to convince me or himself? 
I don't know. Mm. I, I'll never know. I still scratch my head going, I just don't get it because I really feel like he loved me. But I think he loved me as much as he could. And I also think he might have, I don't know. I think he's an addiction. It, he yeah. needs to heal but some I, parts of himself. I think too, uh, too also, too many times we as women ignore our gut and ignore mm-hmm. that voice that tells us, you know, to take a step back and look around and listen. Um, it's just, I think, just what you're saying. I mean, it's so valuable if people just take that away even from this is like, take listen to your gut, you know, listen to your gut and listen to your, trust your inner voice. But I think a lot of times we, we just don't do that. So why don't we do that? Why do we not trust ourselves? Because we're not taught to. Yeah. You know, our parents, I don't know about your parents, but mm-hmm. they did the best they could. It was a different time. You know, now maybe we'll learn to, mm-hmm. but I know for me, even when I was a kid and like, I was hanging out with friends and I, I think I heard Glenn and Doyle or someone talk about this. She's coming on tomorrow. Yeah, she's coming on our podcast. Yeah. Oh. We were like freaking, oh we were freaking, we were freaking out by you. So don't worry, but we're like oh. freaking out also. Like <laughs> she's coming on tomorrow at 1030. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, we're super that's excited. Gonna great. That's mm-hmm. going to be great. I know. And you well, know, it's funny about manifestation and I'll let you finish your story, but I was med- meditating and I was like, oh, she just hasn't responded like, you know what? It's been a couple weeks. Just just keep putting it out there. And I just finished her book. And then she messaged me. She said, I'd love to come on. Like, <laughs> does 1030 work? And I was like, the <laughs> club opened up. I love I that. that. You're going to have mm-hmm. so much fun. I can't wait to hear it. Oh, I hope so well, good. She, I think she talks about mm-hmm. how, how, like, let's say a parent comes into the room mm-hmm. and is like, are you guys hungry? And instead of going, hmm, am I? And asking ourselves. Yes or no? No, not hungry. I would like look to my friends, mm-hmm. and I still do that. I'm like, so you hungry? To decide whether we're going to eat, I don't ask myself. I ask everybody else around me first, rather than, you know. So I don't think we're necessarily. I I wasn't, and I don't think a lot of women. I can't generalize, of course. Mm-hmm. A lot of women weren't taught that tool of going within and asking, mm-hmm. and t- to nurture that muscle of trusting ourselves and letting that guide us. We let a man guide us or our parents mm-hmm. or our friend that seems more powerful or money, you drugs, and alcohol. Your um dad a lot. Were you close to your mom? <laughs> yes. You were also close to your mom. Yeah. Yeah, I was close to my mom. My mom was very um yeah, she didn't check in a lot. She she would look to other people as well. She's mm-hmm. beautiful, beautiful, wonderful um, woman, very funny, but like quietly. So my dad's mm-hmm. very like expressive and kind of this mm-hmm. comes across as a stronger one. Um, but my mom's very delicate and very, very humorous. Like she, she makes very funny jokes and I love that I can laugh with her about it. She mm-hmm. made a joke where I thought I was going to stay with maybe stay. And I told her, I said, you know, he texted me, my, my, my ex-husband, he texted me, um, you know, I love you. I always have, and I always will. And then my mom said, and then did he write, oops, wrong person. <laughs> You're like too soon. <laughs> too soon. No. Too soon. <laughs> it wasn't. No, I, I died. And there's, so much, <sighs> there's so much humor in pain. I, I, we go back to that. You know, I do think that a lot of our comedy comes from these moments and mm-hmm. we've all had him, you know, I, I've been married for, Oh my God, I think it was 10, it was yesterday, by the way. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> That's what happens, man, when you've been with someone oh. for a very long time. We met really young and because I'm only 22, no. Um, I'm in my 30s, but we met like early 20s. And so we've been together 15, 14 years and um, married for, I think it was 10. But the first thing, firstly, I forgot. And then I said to him, oh, fuck, like, we, d- we now get half of each other's earnings and we <laughs> break up because it was 10 years. And then we went to bed. Um, and then we ate like food and then we went to bed. So yeah, I mean, you have to find this in relationships as, you know, you always find the funny in some of the hard moments that we have. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, wi- I'm very much wired that way. I was able to joke even from like day one of it happening. I oh. go in between though, like dying laughing and then hysterically crying and yeah it's not a oh something's weird with my sound can you hear me uh, yeah yeah can you, can hear, you hear us can you hear us <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> He's like, no. So I mean, this is this is pretty fresh. What happened, you know, just in the last year or so? But do you do you see yourself um, maybe even sooner rather than later, kind of starting to mm-hmm. date and just putting yourself out there? I do. I'd like to be the Bachelorette. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I vote Don't for we you. All. <laughs> I mean, oh my god, I would just be the best. No, I, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. I want that. I want a family. Like, okay. I was sitting on the couch in, I think it was April where I was like, oh, I want kids now. And I felt that feeling that, that mm-hmm. women get. And I was like, oh, is that what that is? Where I was like, oh, I oh, want yeah. a baby. Or was it the burrito so, you had for dinner? It was probably the burrito. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. When that, when that clicks in, Roxy's going to tell you that she didn't have that Mm-mm. before. Like that was kind of, they didn't want to have kids and was kind of like a whoopsie daisy. <laughs> and here we go. But I remember when I, so when I turned 29, I was like, oh, I'm old, which is so ridiculous. And I was like, I'm 29, I need to have a baby. And I got like, like an animal. I wanted him to impregnate me. So, and it wasn't sexy. It wasn't romantic. It wasn't hot. It was like, you must spread your seed now. I have two rabbits and they hump each other. And it was like that. (laughs) He was very afraid of me because it was like, I just knew. And I knew I wanted a baby and I knew it had to happen now. And I, he was at a meeting and I called him. He's like, I'm at a board meeting, like with seven people. I'm like, I don't care. I just peed on an ovulation stick and it said, I'm I'm ovulating. You get home right now. And he did. And my da- first daughter was born. So that's about trusting your gut. Yeah. So my second was a long road to, to having her. But my first daughter was that time that I called him home from that meeting. If he didn't come home, we, like she might not be here. So it was taking control of that gut feeling that you were talking about. Wow. Yeah, I want that. I want it to be that uh, instantaneous. It's <laughs> like, my second took years and a lot of hell, but um, but you, sometimes it can be, you know? Yeah, I want a big house. I was I grew up as an only child, so I want like mm. a big house with a bunch of kids. Okay, interesting. So my daughter is an only child. So we have one daughter, six years old, and we're sort of like is it good? Is it bad? You know, like the next, I mean, uh, just like generally speaking, I guess growing up as an only child, did you feel like you missed out on anything or was it pretty positive? Um, yeah, I mean, I missed out on being able to talk to someone else that wasn't my parents to go like, Hey, isn't dad being kind of crazy right now? Or (laughs) Like just that bonding thing. And I think I had a, I think I had trouble sharing and I didn't learn that until later. Mm. like how, the importance of others first. Cause it was just like, I got smothered with attention and love and I was the most important thing. And so mm. I, when I even sharing attention sometimes, uh, it's fine now, but it was tough. But you must've been, it made you so much closer to your parents. Yes. <laughs> yes, it did. It, it did. did. Okay. It had its perks too. Cause I, you know, then I also felt unique and special, which again can be a lot of pressure on mm. an only child. Mm-hmm. So I, so I actually had to, when I, especially when I learned NLP, I had to ask my dad to re say how he said stuff. Cause he would say stuff like, you're the most important thing to me. Mm-hmm. You're, you're everything. And I'd be like, can you just like tone it down and just say, <laughs> just say like, you're, you're all right. Or like, you're special, but not that special. Okay, it was, so I was you, trying to like micromanage when he was talking to me because it felt like, ah, I see, that's what I, I that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, that's yeah. what I do to my daughter. I'm like, you're my everything, you know, you're the best, you're super special. So I should tone it down a little bit, is what you're saying. My yeah. daughter's like, I go, I would suggest, hey, that. guess what? And she uh-huh. goes, I know you love me, you <laughs> say every day. <laughs> I'm like, there's a lot of people here who have no love, okay? And they're worse off than you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can say you're my, um, you're my everything. That's what my dad used to say. And I, the way I took it was not great. Oh, okay. But just because it felt like, ah, oh my God, I can't, I can't, there's no room for me to mess up then. Mm. Or, or he's not going to be okay. So just as long as you, you, allow her to see you in your strength of like, no matter what, I'm okay. And I got this and I don't need any, like, not, I don't need anybody, but But I I always felt like my Mm. dad's happiness was determined on me Mm. about whether I 
you know, loved him enough or it was just, it was just too heavy. Okay. Okay. Like maybe you say I'm, Mm. um, you're my everything. And so am I. Ooh, I like it. Shared the shared spotlight. So that she knows yeah. that she's also allowed to be her everything as well because mm. her, she sees her mom being her, her mom. Like she sees her mom, that her mom, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> we get it. <laughs> get it. She <laughs> that, like she mm-hmm. should be everything for her mm-hmm. and know that she's like enough and that it's within her. And so if she sees you love and approve of yourself, she mm-hmm. will learn to love and approve of herself. I wish I would have seen more of my mom um, love and approve of herself more and not like pick herself apart. You know, that was, I just think learned. We, yeah, we all model we all, the people yeah. around us, whether they're our parents or not, but that's why you got to be careful with who you're around. Yeah, the, all that see, you're done. <laughs> no, right? I'm like, I've only so seen you in quarantine for <laughs> six months. I'm done. <laughs> well, man, and really, totally. you know, like a never have I ever. Um, I love this. Yes. yes. Okay, you have to Let's say do it. I have or never. We still aren't really, we really don't know the rules. <laughs> and it's been like a year and yeah. a half. So you'd think we would have got it down by now, but um, we are those types of people. <laughs> So I think you say I have or never. Isn't that right? Yeah, Ross? I think that sounds about right. When I've okay. seen it play out. Yeah. Okay. Give a give her a good one. Oh, okay. Okay. So never have I ever ooh, slept with a friend. <laughs> That's, is always an answer? No. <laughs> Every damn time. Every damn time. Um I have, Ooh, like Anna? a, but it was, yeah. there was a, it was a man friend. It wasn't like a my girlfriend. So it was somebody you were already friends with for a while. I have, I have. <laughs> okay. Um, Roxy. no, no, because you Roxy. know what? No, 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 <laughs> no, because you know Roxy. what? <laughs> no. Because you know why? Because once why? somebody hits a friend zone for me, they can't get out of the box. I, I it's got I'm once never a guy get laid by yeah, you. Well, you're an exception, of course. Yeah, <laughs> one year old, <laughs> right? No, but it's so hard. I don't know if you gals are the same, but like, if a guy hits that friend box for me, he can't get out. Like, I don't I, have guy friends. But before you were married. No, they were guys I saw. With. <laughs> <laughs> I don't find I find very difficult. This sounds like I find it very difficult to keep my pants on. No, <laughs> I find it very difficult. If I have a connection to a guy, I normally find something sexy right, about right, him. Right, right, right. And then I want to have sex with him, or I wonder why he doesn't want to have sex with me. <laughs> or it's it's I don't I know, and I know that people can have really great guy friends, and I get it. And Madden seems to have so many because yep. I, I look on her, her Instagram and her videos and she does skits with them and stuff. But for me, I always feel like it's one person wants more. Mm. I don't know. It's either me or them. O- or you don't get on in a connective way. I mean, that's not true. Gay, I do have gay guy friends mm-hmm. because there's no, there's no way for there to be anything sexual. Yeah. The, it's, but it's like safe, right? <laughs> it's kind of safe. Yeah. Yeah. But I find it hard. Like before I was married, mm-hmm. it either went down the sexual route or there was an issue. Like, maybe it was the fact that I was always naked. That was. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we're supposed to have a friendship date. <laughs> <laughs> just take it out. <laughs> yeah. My boots aren't supposed to be out. Oh, sorry. I thought we were just having. Co- okay. Sorry. <laughs> just how I am with my friends. Just- yeah. <laughs> relax like we're friends <laughs> okay I'm gonna ask you one more okay never have I ever oh we just talked about this kissed a girl they seem to be all sexual don't worry they're not all sexual <laughs> I have I had to do it in a film too I always get roles not always but I get a lot of lesbian roles for some reason hmm but on a film set it's so like sterile right it's but I've, like... I've definitely been blacked out and kiss friends and been like oh my god who knew <laughs> that your lips, lips, lips are so soft yeah no i've had drunken days where i've definitely kissed girls not a it's lot funny though, girls can kiss girls and it's like oh that was that time your lips are so cool smooth and soft but mm-hmm. if, like if a guy kisses a guy you're like mm. 
I feel very different. Yeah. It feels very yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. You don't hear a lot of drunk. We got drunk and made out stories yeah. Yeah. from guys. <laughs> like, in the front uh, house. <laughs> <laughs> You're gay. <laughs> like, I think that's called gay. Uh, <laughs> totally. Oh. Okay. Another one. Okay. Never have I ever stolen a comedy idea. Mm. Wasn't well, that TikTok? Yeah, yeah that's TikTok. Right. That's exactly. actually called TikTok is called stealing comedy. Yeah. So I I have to say I have because of that. Mm. But like knowingly, have you sort of gone in and seen somebody do before TikTok? Before TikTok, hell no. I was completely. Uh-huh. I'm gonna come up with this because I I mm-hmm. hated that. That's why I, don't, I never watched stand up was because I was so afraid that I would somehow unconsciously pick up somebody Mm -hmm. else's joke and then Mm -hmm. tell it. So I can honestly say, and I take a lot of pride in that before TikTok, I've not knowingly stole anyone's idea. And I will say that I probably have unconsciously like a sponge because we're all sponges. Everything that we produce is stuff that we've seen and and then it comes Mm -hmm. out in a new way. So knowingly, no, I didn't like see a video and go, I'm going to do that now too. But mm-hmm. I've had my video stolen for dang sure. Like, mm. like verbatim for words. I did a TikTok. I mean, I did, I did a Vine um, with Matt Cutshaw and it was the notebook thing. And it was like, what do you want? What do you want? And I was like, Chipotle. And he's like, what? what? Whatever. Chips and guacamole. And then the, the bigger, bigger, bigger million millionaires did the exact same one like a week later with the same words. This was like, you know, five years ago, but I remember mm. being like, well, you can steal it, but like make it different somehow. You can't just yeah. do the same exact. It's lazy. Yeah. yeah. Have you done that, Tamman? Have you stolen comedy? My whole damn life is just, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but just because my husband's like a really good comedy writer mm-hmm. and like he would just be not because of myself, but because he'd be really mad at me probably <laughs> if I stole something. Um. No, but, but, but everything's been done before, right? Mm-hmm. So this is it's one thing that when Manon was saying like, yes, someone took word for word, that's, that's a complete, you know, mm-hmm. steal of an idea. But I, even yesterday came up with three funny ideas. And then I was looking through YouTube and someone had, I don't know if it's like Google listens to like things because you get shown sim- similar ideas. And I'm like, huh, that's so interesting. That's just, that was just done. Even like pitching TV shows, you know, I had some a great TV show I was about to take into Fox and then I just saw it. It's already on online. It was called, it's called love, love on in the, uh, love in the time of uh, Corona. Have you oh, seen those mm-hmm, posters? Mm-hmm. I came up with that idea and then somebody else did. So everything's kind of a, a version of it. Like everything's been done before, you know? So it's like, sometimes you don't, you're not stealing an idea and it's just people mm-hmm. have similar tastes. What's that mm-hmm. book? Big Magic. Who wrote? I'm listening to it right now. Okay, mm. so she talks about how those there's floating ideas up there all of the time and they, they're going to come in through you. And if you don't use it, they're going to float to someone else because That's they're... Literally, that, I just listened to that. Yeah, chapter. isn't it so oh, good? Yeah. It makes it such so a great. different experience to go, oh, it's not my idea, it's an idea. And if mm-hmm. I don't do it, and if I don't produce it or do justice, it's going to go to somebody else. That happened to my dad as a screenwriter all the time where he, mm. he was like, wait, what? I wrote Click. Or how to marry a millionaire that I I wrote and now it's win a date with Ted Hamilton, son of a bitch. And then <laughs> you know, but this was like a long time ago. But I remember his frustration with it as a writer. And now I, I do feel like TikTok has given me permission to now just full full on steal everything all the yeah. time. <laughs> right. Whatever. But not even really. Well, some people just steal it, but you can put your own stamp on something like. The WAP, whatever WAP. How do you even say that? That dance it's right now. You know, Sean and I, my husband and I did it like without chins. Like we're, you know, dancing without chins. And we made little mops and like macaroni boxes. Like you're you're taking the idea, but then you're putting your own spin on it. Mm-hmm. And so it's not that's not a stealing of an idea, I think. I think like that's your own artistic interpretation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, I think our time's up, oh, Roxy Sapi. No, say it ain't so. Say it ain't so. Say it ain't so. We've had so much fun with you. Manon. Manon. How Manon. do I say it in the French way? Manon. 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 Je m'appelle. Je m'appelle Manon. Je m'appelle Manon. Manon, tell us. Je m'appelle Manon. Manon. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but no, tell us where everybody can find you. Well, you can find me at Man and Matthews on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I have my podcast, Serious But Funny. And then mm-hmm. my book is called Funny How It Works Out, where I write about my life. And I think that's it. <laughs> That is it. Just, and we are Women on Top Instagram. What, what, I get this wrong every time. Every women on time. Top Official on Instagram. And Women on Top Podcast on Facebook. And do not forget to rate, subscribe, and comment on iTunes. I am Sock. And I am Roxy Manning. And we are Women, women on, on Top. top.